So Penn Wharton Budget Model started about seven years ago. That's right. How did it get started and what was the genesis of the idea behind it? Yeah, it was really members of Congress who I already was having conversations with. They they were they really wanted uh, analysis not after they wrote the legislation, not after it went to a chairperson, maybe what went over to like the CBO or some of the other scoring agencies. They wanted analysis at the very beginning while they're actually writing legislation. So they wanted to know what was the effects before they put their reputation on the line. What's the effect on the budget? What's the effect on the economy? What's the effect on people? Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney. And in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. Well, it's a pleasure to be joined right now by Kent Smetters, who is a professor of business economics and public policy here at the Wharton School, as well as faculty director of the Penn Wharton Budget Model. Kent, great to see you again. Great to be back. Fair to say when we're talking about economy and economics right now that we're in a period of time where there is more interest on what's occurring and how it's occurring than maybe we've seen in, in times past? Yeah, it, it definitely true. It's the last time we've really had this type of focus, especially given the focus on inflation. It's been over 40 years. You have to go back to the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan first term, to really see this level of interest. And also that people are understanding that you know inflation is this real phenomenon. It's not just you know a textbook issue that the Federal Reserve has to worry about. It really has a big pocketbook issue as well. So Penn Wharton budget model started about seven years ago. That's right. How did it get started and what was the genesis of the idea behind it? Yeah, it was really members of Congress who I already was having conversations with. They, they, were, they really wanted uh, analysis not after they wrote the legislation, not after it went to a chairperson, maybe what went over to like the CBO or some of the other scoring agencies. They wanted analysis at the very beginning while they're actually writing legislation. So they wanted to know what was the effects before they put their reputation on the line, what's the effect on the budget, what's the effect on the economy, what's the effect on people. And um, that's really how we operate very differently. We do a lot of analysis. It's not even on our website directly with policymakers on both sides of the aisle who just are looking for an understanding of the impact of their legislation and before they put pen to paper, before they put the reputation on the line. So then in the landscape of what's going on in Washington right now, what do you think the benefit has been of having a resource like that to be able to bring this type of information forward? It's ultimately about credibility. We've become known very much as the honest broker. Uh, at any point in time, one side may really dislike us for our analysis. Honest in Washington, yeah, D.C.? I, I know. Sometimes that's a challenge. It is because there's a lot of groups in uh, D.C. that call themselves nonpartisan. They're really for tax purposes because you can give to a nonpartisan, deduct the uh, amount that you're giving, um, even though they're doing a lot of advocacy in terms of issues and things like that. We are not just nonpartisan. We go one step further. We're non-normative. What that simply means is that We'll never advocate for a policy. We'll simply do the analysis as what we think is as best as possible and let the numbers just be what they are. Let the chips fall where they may. And um, at any point in time, one party may love that number, uh, another party may hate that number. But if you look at who asks us for numbers, it's coming from both sides of the aisle now. If you look at our free certificate program that we do in Washington, D.C., that is available to anybody interested in policy, but not surprisingly, a lot of capital staff, it's basically evenly split between both parties. And so even, yes, uh, people on both sides have said that they find our, our numbers often scary when they're writing legislation, <laughs> they still respect it. How much then do you also think that it, it has, while maybe it wasn't the intentional goal right from the outset, uh, of also focusing on the issue of bias that we see play out in and around Washington, D.C. as well. Yeah, there's a lot of problems with the metrics that are traditionally used in Washington, D.C. So Republicans typically focus on just a macro outcome, Democrats on distributional outcome. Economists have never believed that either measure is the right one to look at a policy. And in particular, we want to have things that are much more integrated 
Uh, so it's something that may look bad for a low-income person simply because they happen to be young may actually be good for them over a lifetime if it happens to grow the economy. And so it, we have a much more integrated approach that actually combines uh, everything. And also we don't truncate uh, like under current rules. Uh, a lot of analysis under current law is done on their five-year or 10-year budget. So anything that is like a pre-K spending program is always going to look bad on their 10-year budget because uh, you spend all the money up front and those you know, four-year-olds are not going into the workforce until decades later. And so whenever you truncate, you're creating this bias. And so we really are, work hard to remove biases and really focus on good economics and, and analysis. I mean, it's true in many ways, what economists have focused on, they have been clever insights and so forth. They never built their models to actually do real policy work. Uh, and the policy work that's often done is really from an advocacy perspective. We're trying to bring the, actually make economics useful in many ways and being, bring the rigor of analysis, tie our hands in a way that the, the, the process has to be rigorous and um, let the chips fall where, where, where they may, uh, may and let economics be really useful. Where does, where does the funding component come from for Penn Wharton budget model? Sure. It's, it's partly alumni and partly that we get grants from different uh, large organizations. And so uh, what we do is really make it clear to everybody that our analysis is our analysis. And if you uh, look at what we have done in the last, you know, five years with, for example, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was largely liked by Wall Street. But in fact, we came out and said it's going to have very little effect on the economy. And on top of that, it will uh, cost a lot more than what the government's official numbers were. And after it got passed, the government's official numbers then came right up to ours. They did a technical revision and came right up to our numbers. And so it, then if you look at the uh, infrastructure bill that was uh, it passed a couple of years ago and then last year, the Inflation Reduction Act, our analysis really played a key role in, in those legislation. Both sides of the aisle said our analysis was pivotal for, for their members. In both cases, you know, highly cited by both by advocates of those policies. On the other hand, we also showed neither policy was going to energize the economy like, you know, the, the advocates were trying to say. And so... Um, uh, not, not terribly surprising. There's lots of overstepping that happens in the political process. Do you see even interest from outside the political realm, like uh, even the public in general? Because as I said, there's such more of an interest in seeing what has been going on and trying to understand it a little better that the public is diving more into something like Ped Morgan budget model to have a better understanding of what's going on. Right. And I would say just because of our size, we're uh, around 30 people with two offices filled off in D.C. We have to be somewhat focused. And our main policy audience has been policymakers them, them, themselves. Having said that, we have definitely tried to write briefs and articles that, that on public legislation. So this is the legislation that's actually been introduced um, either as a bill or signed into law. Um, that's accessible on our website. But even there, I will admit that sometimes uh, it, things can get a little, little advanced when you're trying to explain hard to understand concepts. And, and so we certainly are trying to do a better job of that over time and give people tools like simulators that they can try to understand things with. I, I will say that, you know, our modeling is often takes hours to run across 75,000 threads in many cases running parallelized computing very detailed calculations, trying to break that down and make it really understandable. It's, it's, a, it's always been a chore, and we, we continue to make improvements, but we're not there yet. But that, under, that element of understanding uh, becomes that more important, even for those members uh, on Capitol Hill or their aides, to have a better framework of understanding of what X might have an impact instead of Y as we move forward with some of this legislation. Right. I mean, I think it's really important a couple of things. One is that we're as transparent as possible with the mechanisms that we're including and not including, um, that, that we're credible, that we are not an advocacy um, organization. But immediately, um, it's still going to be hard for staff to, to uh, on the Capitol Hill, even trained staff, to really understand everything that's kind of going on because there's a lot. So we're working hard to really document things, first for the experts who could validate and understand what's going on, 
and making sure that uh, for everybody else that we're communicating in the way that is as straightforward as possible, knowing that we're never going to get that completely right. And so uh, we live in a country where just basic financial literacy is often very challenging and um, we're not going to solve all those problems. We're going to try to do best we can with our limited headcount. So obviously one of the big stories right now involves the debt, uh, which has been talked about a lot. How then does Penn Wharton budget model look to try and address some of the issues that are out there in and around uh, the level of debt that we have in this country? Yeah, the debt is it continues to increase relative to the size of the economy. There's no end in sight on that. And um, right now, neither side is proposing really anything that will address that. And so that's a very scary outlook in the sense that um, that's happened at the same time a large carbon debt is accumulating. And, it, you know, if you think things are a little bit kind of crazy now and the politics and the world and so forth, um, this is actually the good time because we actually are very capital flush right now in the United States and the world, as a lot of people are going into retirement, they have a lot of retirement savings. In a, a decade from now, we're gonna see a lot of that saving um, have uh, disappeared. And as a result of that, or uh, have continued to, to disappear. And um, as a result, we're gonna really have this convergence between a debt that's spiraling out of control, carbon's still gonna keep on going to where it's going, and then um, the resources of the uh, the capital deepening that we have right now is going to go away. And so it is one of those things that we're really trying to get people to look down the, 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 the road a, a, a lot more than they currently are. You know, both sides have taken strict positions of what they're willing and not willing to do. You know, the fact of the matter is if you're not willing to raise taxes on those making less than $400,000 a year, which the Democrats have said, um, you, there's not enough money left over in the high income, the high wealth, and so forth. Everybody thinks that there's tons of money up there. They, they're they not understanding the size of the imbalance right now. There's just not enough money up there. There has to be broad-based uh, either increase in revenue or decrease in spending. And then on the other side of the aisle, the Republicans are also taking you know positions about no new tax in increases, but we're not going to touch entitlement programs either. Well, th that doesn't add up either. So both sides really need to come to grips with the situation. And what we're going to do is we're really, in the past, what we've done is we've created these policy, uh, these the different policy options. But they typically were things like uh, before the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or the Infrastructure Bill or IRA or before that um, Build Back Better or some of the cash payments. And we lay out the options and the policymakers a lot of times are picking one of those options. That's what they form in the law. What we're going to be doing going forward is also uh, creating these policy bundles because there's lots of interactions between things like what you do to Social Security and the rest of the economy and the rest of the tax bases. And we're going to be looking at those um, big bundles and trying to show people, first, uh, the path that we're on. This is not sustainable. It literally will collapse the economy if we don't do something. But secondly, then lay out here is different options. Uh, for dealing with this, and they all have different trade-offs, and just let's be super transparent um, about that. Is that the the concept, the, the belief that the idea of the bundle is going to be something that we're going to be talking about more and more, where you're bringing some of these elements together kind of under one package as we move forward? I think so. I mean, usually the politics is, you know, you try to be incremental, make small changes. The problem with incrementalism is, first of all, it's too late for that in the United States. Um, we've, uh, we're really too far along in the debt path. Uh, so we need um, to make bigger changes sooner. But the second is uh, some people feel like actually what happens with those incremental changes is that you've had too many people who benefit from that particular tax provision or spending provision. They lobby intensely. And maybe now is the day for the big bu for the big bundles uh, to work their way in where, you know, everybody's a loser at, at, in some ways today, but we're making these investments for the future generations. Kent, always great to talk with you and get your insight on all of these things. Thanks very much. And all the best with the Penn Wharton budget model. And for people that do want to follow it, the website is? You can simply Google Penn Wharton budget model, and that will be actually the easiest to find. All right, great. Thanks, Kent. All the best to you. Th thank you. Thank you. Wharton School's Kent Smetters. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.